take. Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this meeting. This is the August meeting of the Technology Enhanced Learning Community of Practice. I can see we've got a good, a good group of people in the room this month. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming along. Uh, as you would have seen from the invitation and probably why you're here, we have a very special presentation from a colleague at Turnitin, Lisa Twitchett, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about academic integrity in the age of AI, particularly focused on, on best, best practice with Turnitin. And I just noticed that it says Turnitin meant on my slides. There we go. Uh, best practice with Turnitin. Lisa's got it right on her slide. And this, as I said, is the Technology Enhanced Learning Community of Practice, which is co-championed by myself. I'm Michael Cowling, uh, Dr. Robert Vandenberg from the School of Education and the Arts here at Seeky University, and Mr. Daryl Clare from the School of Health, Medical and Applied Sciences. So I'm going to start, as we often do, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on. And as I always say when I come to one of these CQU style meetings is that could be anywhere, all right? CQU is Australia-wide, and so goodness only knows where you are. But regardless of the lands that you're on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of those lands and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. For me in particular, and you've probably heard me say this before, I'm on the Gold Coast, I live on the Gold Coast, that is the Ugambea people, the Ugambia nation. But if I were at the Brisbane campus, it would be the Jagara and the Turbul people, which is our Brisbane campus of CQU. Uh, and if you'd like, you can type in the chat uh, who are the uh, traditional owners of the land that you're on, if you'd like. So what is the Technology Enhanced Learning Community of Practice? Well, it's all about technology enhanced learning. It's all about making learning better through technology. And so I, I guess who better to have than somebody from Turn It In, which has been focused apparently for 25 years based on Lisa's uh, background on making uh, learning better through technology. And so the Telcop focuses on that and it focuses particularly on best practice with technology and so we get an academic and a learning designer style audience of people that are interested in making their education experience and what they're doing in the classroom better through technology and so hopefully i've kind of summarized what it says on that slide uh, and haven't missed anything uh, but feel free to have a read of it I want to throw in, I always try and throw in a couple of reminders. In this one, I want to remind you that all of our episodes are on YouTube. Uh, Lisa doesn't know it because I didn't want to scare her, but I actually had quite a few people email me and say, I'd love to see this, but I can't. Um, I'm, I'm teaching or something else at the time, and I was able to email them all back and say all of the, the Telcop presentations are on YouTube. There is the YouTube link. If, you, if it's too tricky to write down, I'm, I, will, I will, might sneak it into the chat while Lisa is talking. Otherwise, feel free to send me an email and I'll email you back the link. Alternatively, it's on my YouTube, Professor Tech's Tech Cube. So if you look up Professor Tech on YouTube, you'll find me. And then it's a playlist called the Telcop uh, Conversations. Uh, and Lisa has suggested uh, that she's fine with us doing that with this link with her presentation as well. So that should appear on there. Of course, that doesn't help anybody that's watching me right now because you're going to be watching it live, right? So why do you need the recording? Or if you're watching the recording, you already found it. And so uh, so that probably doesn't help you. But, uh, but for others, like for instance, the presentation that we had last time from scholars at the University of Wollongong or any of the ones that you can see on the slide, um, there's an opportunity there for you to go and watch those if you'd like. So I mentioned the champions of the of the Telcop already, uh, just to give you a little bit about who we are, and I'm not going to spend very long on these because we're not the special guests, really. Uh, Robert Vandenberg is one of the champions of our Telcop. You can see him on the screen there. Robert is going to help us with the Q&A a little bit at the end, and this is where I, I chime in and let you know that if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Lisa, type them into the chat, and Robert and myself will help to uh, maybe moderate some of those questions. It gives you an opportunity to... Uh, Ask a question if you're not willing to open your microphone and ask the question. We will be your voice. 
but Robert is a senior lecturer in the School of Education and the Arts here at CQ University, uh, as well as an award winner of the AAUT Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning and the CQU Opal Award. And he lives in Bundaberg and is a proud Bundaberg native. I always say that when you go to Robert's house, his walls are basically painted with the Bundaberg colours and he has banners everywhere. It's absolutely, no, maybe not that bad, but he is definitely a proud Bundaberg citizen. This is me, I'm Michael Cowling, uh, also known as Professor Tech, Associate Professor in Engineering and Tech at CQ University. Um, I'm not gonna talk about myself, that seems very self-serving really, but you can you can read the slide. And then last but not least, Daryl Clare, who a lot of you probably know, if you want some sort of boot camp workshop training on technology enhanced learning, Daryl is your guy. If you want to know how to do something with technology, especially in the XR, VR, AR, mobile space, Daryl's your guy. His vocation is a paramedic, but he is all about innovative education. Uh, if you go back to the list I showed you before, Daryl did a boot camp for us, not this one, I think maybe one or two telcops ago about uh, AI art, and it was really interesting. You might want to watch it. Um, but uh, that's us. The real guest of the hour is Lisa, Lisa Twitchett from Turn It In. I uh, mercilessly stole Lisa's um, uh, bio from LinkedIn, uh, where she talks very much about providing assistance to us in the education sector on implementing technology to maintain academic integrity which is exactly what we're interested in her talking about today. And she works with uh, across uh, Australia, New Zealand, and also Hong Kong. And, and I didn't put it in the brackets, but it's actually account manager brackets, ANZHK, Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. And with people like us, personnel from IT, heads of departments, academic integrity leads, and uh, educators as well. And so we're really looking forward to hearing a little bit from Lisa about what she's what Turnitin's doing in regards to academic, academic integrity and she's going to tell us a little bit about the best practice for Turnitin. Usually at this point I share a silly little photo of somebody right if I can find one I couldn't find one of Lisa and so in the end I just shared this one which is all of the cool stuff that Turnitin does. Um, you might hear about some of these tools as Lisa is talking. And so I wanted to share this because I think when we think turn it in, we often think about a PDF with a bunch of red and and, uh, and yellow and orange highlights on it, right? And that percentage number our students get, it's actually much broader than that, including grade scope, which is really interesting. And so Lisa might tell us a little bit about all of these things. But that's it from me. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to our guest speaker. So I will stop sharing. And we've tested okay. this already. So Lisa should be able to hit the um, share button and away <laughs> you go. That should work. Can everyone see my screen, hopefully? Awesome. We can indeed. Thank you very, very much uh, for that very kind introduction, Michael. I do appreciate it. Um, as mentioned, I am the Turnitin Account Manager for CQU. Um, I have been at Turnitin for over. Oh, five and a half years um, at this point. Um, so I'm part of the furniture now and I'm the go-to for all things Turnitin, um, whether that be uh, Turnitin Feedback Studio or our different uh, services and product offerings. Um, some of those mentioned in that slide um, and they will be mentioned throughout the presentation today. Uh, as Michael mentioned, we do have time uh, for a Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, so if you could please um, either put your questions in the chat and we can obviously go through them at the end um, when we have time. Any questions that we don't get to, um, Michael will share those with me and I can get those answers um, for you and he can yeah share those, those answers with you after this presentation. Um, but there is some time for questions at the end. Perfect. So the agenda for today, uh, we're going to start by um, talking about promoting academic integrity awareness. Uh, I will then speak to you about AI uh, within digital learning environments, uh, particularly our uh, product offering a great scope. Um, then I'll finish with a few slides and some resources um, around our AI indication tool. Um, and as, as mentioned, we have some time for a Q&A at the end of the session. 
So I wanted to start uh, by sharing some of these numbers with you. Um, you all know Turn It In. Um, it's an experienced and trusted globally um, with coverages for all assignments in all courses all of the time. Uh, so original work matters in every single discipline, as we know, for both educational and professional settings. And we have uh, solutions that are fit for both, um, going beyond um, um, above and beyond just the plagiarism, I always check that, you know, as Michael kind of touched on, we're well known for, um, but ensuring uh, authenticity across all subject areas um, with our unparalleled and ever-growing content database is our priority. So build, um, how to build uh, foster and foster integrity, equity, and meaningful learning. So Turnitin is your partner uh, in empowering students throughout their whole learning journey. So from the beginning, um, when students gain fundamental skills um, from practice and feedback uh, to then higher education and high state courses, uh, program uh, examinations or professional research and writing. Our comprehensive suite helps learners build uh, confidence in their skills and reinforce trust within those uh, credentials. Turnitin's comprehensive assessment suite um, provides capabilities. So those that you can see circled on the right uh, that can be leveraged as needed in Turnitin products in order to provide outcomes, which are those wedges that you see on the left um, that instructors, administrators, and students need for success. So we have a vast range of, of products and solutions that we offer our partners. Um, so predominantly, and the most common one is our feedback studio with originality suite, uh, which kind of focuses on that grading and feedback, as well as that similarity report that you all know. We have Authenticate for, you know, your researchers at PDH uh, students. So kind of that next level when it comes to obviously that plagiarism check for, for research um, and, and thesis, those type of things. We are also working to include the AI writing detection tool within our new version of Authenticate V2, um, which is due for release at the end of the year. We also have Gradescope, um, which I'll pro be providing a quick demonstration of today. Um, so that's in terms of your yeah, assessment creations of all different types of assessments. So beyond that, uh, you know, writing form or essays, as well as analytics. Uh, and we do have uh, exam soft, uh, which is your proctoring uh, and identity for those high level stakes exams. Integrity is at the core of everything we do here at Turnitin. Uh, our complementary products are learner-centric, uh, built to provide students, instructors, and administrators with the right features, as well as the right functionalities to address diverse needs and deliver every assessment with integrity. When we speak of integrity uh, in the educational context, we're talking about academic integrity. So what is academic integrity? The most widely uh, accepted definition comes from the International Council of Academic uh, Integrity, which lists 10 principles from academic integrity, which can be grouped into these four areas. Um, so the first one being define policy. Um, so reveal the values of your institution and how they should guide and shape the behavior of students with an academic integrity policy. The second is raise awareness. So among administrators, faculties, and students, educate, most cheating is actually not from malice, but from the lack of skills. Students need to learn the academic and writing skills to avoid misconduct. And lastly, protect your values. So institutions need a way of ensuring that their values are being embraced by students and that the degree you are granting connotes quality. Um, that's where the protection comes in. 
I wanted to share with you and Michael will put these links in the chat also um, and I can share these with you after but we have some really good resources so from regular conversations that I have with academic and educators um, it's beyond those kind of all right we know what the similarity report is we know how it works we've seen the guides but what other resources do we provide and offer educators um, to gain a digital uh, a digital, additional information and insights um, to help kind of support those conversations, to support, to support that further development, uh, as well as being able to provide insights about what's happening, um, obviously, kind of within the educational space um, and being able to share that information and those resources with your, with your peers. Uh, it might be on your educator intranet, um, as well as, you know, sharing things with students. So it kind of takes away that that um, angst when it comes to the mention of, of Turn It In um, when students have those supporting resources that they can see. So we get feedback from our partners all the time um, in, uh, around what kind of topics um, or topic area, areas and information are most useful. Um, and we obviously use that feedback to be able to, to provide and create resources um, that align with what our partners want. So the first one I'm showing you, and these are really good things to, to bookmark these links um, so you can refer back to them. It might not be that all of this content, there is a lot, um, might be relevant to you, to your role or to what you're after. Um, but I would always suggest having a look through, you do have the search um, functionality available as well um, that you can search for things. If there's something that in particular that you want and you can't find, obviously, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, again, we do take on that feedback in terms of what resources um, our educators and our partners would find most useful. So we have a whole heap of resources here, um, you know, things from stories from the classrooms, a lot of stuff about AI. We do have our own AI landing page, which I will show you later on. We have resources um, that are broken down um, in particular categories. So the first one being your resources for your educators. We have resources specifically for administrators. So, um, for example, you can see there's a blog post here on why academic integrity is important to teaching and learning. So kind of putting all of those pieces of the puzzle together above and beyond just, you know, what Turnitin does and its product, its software, those type of things, but the supporting resources and materials that align with what we do. And we do have resources for students as well. Um, so often students will come to you and say, okay, you know, we need a little bit of guidance. So can you explain to me what is the difference between academic integrity and plagiarism? Uh, and instead of kind of trying to make those things up, you'll be able to say, we actually have a really good resource that, you know, helps you identify and provides you a really good thorough explanation about this. And I can share that with you. We also have our Turnitin blog page. Um, this is updated regularly. We have some really fantastic blogs. Um, you know, we speak to a lot of our partners here um, in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong. We do, you know, integrity matters and all of those type of things. So I would suggest, you know, subscribing to um, our blogs page. I promise we won't spam you. Um, there may be some things that, you know, again, are relatable to you and your role and others that may not be, um, but it's a really good way to keep up to date of, of what's happening um, in Turn It In and obviously the conversation um, that your peers are having within the educational space. So both really good resources, highly recommend um, that you bookmark them and, and take a, a look through in your own time. So now I'm going to talk about uh, AI within digital learning environments and I'm actually going to focus on grade scope today. So the more conversations we're having around AI 
the more they're changing. So when I AI kind of blew up at the start of the year and there was so much like panic and angst about, well, what's going to happen? How is this going to change education? What do we need to do as a university to shift things, redesign curriculum, relook at assessment, all of those type of things? As time's gone on, those conversations have started to change. Uh, and it's more about, okay, so as a university, how can we actually embrace AI? How can this actually help and support us? So this may not be, you know, there may be kind of some negative things that are happening and some people that are using it for not the right thing, and that's okay. But how can we actually use AI to be able to, you know, help um, in a positive way, how can it help support educators? How can it be used to improve the painful time consuming tasks? Um, and how can educators benefit from AI tools um, to support them in digital learning environments? Gradescope's innovation grading experience makes instructors more effective um, and efficient. It solves the challenges common to paper and digital assessment, especially. Um, but there is a vast range of assessment uh, solutions that sit within Gradescope. Um, so whether it's bubble sheets, whether it's multiple choice, whether it's short answer. Um, and it uh, gives you, as an educator or a marker, um, the ability to provide students with faster feedback, um, with more clarity and consistency. An example of this is Gradescope's assessment platform that uses AI um, and dynamic rubrics uh, to dramatically reduce the pain and time associated with grading across all subjects. So this is something that I have a conversation about in my daily uh, you know, meetings uh, and, and catch ups with with our partners about those those high pain points when it comes to the time associated, obviously, with marking and how educators and, and markers can do things better um, and how we um, at Turnitin can address uh, kind of those pain points for teachers um, and how we can obviously assist in this process. So, I'm sure you're all aware you've all spent a lot of time um, grade, uh, grading things. It, it is time consuming um, and it is a very manual task. The combination of digitalization, AI, auto grading and digital rubrics from Gradescope cuts grading time by up to 80%. Uh, so pretty, pretty massive um, in terms of, especially when you're dealing with a lot. So you're thinking of kind of 100, you know, 200 up to 1,000 and even more. How can we use AI um, and Gradescope as a tool to be able to make things more concise and consistent for your grading process? Improve greater Co uh, collaboration. So consistent and coordinated gradient grading is tedious. The who, the how, bias, eek, it all sounds pretty yuck to me. Uh, greater consistency comes from building and using a, di um, a digital rubric uh, and working in a problem set where you can easily coordinate between you know, multiple professors, graders, TAs, um, or instructors anywhere at any time. It um, also provides really beneficial insights um, and analytics from the data from this. So really deep insights into the success and assessment quality um, that are from an educator standpoint as well as a student standpoint um, to ensure that educators and students are meeting their learning goals um, and succeeding together. So from the top level down, being able to see that um, success criteria from a, a university perspective uh, down to the educator, the subject area, as well as the student is hugely powerful. So how does Gradescope do this? 
it automatically generates advanced statistics and allows institutions easy insight into the effectiveness of their curriculum. In addition uh, to viewing the raw data, um, uh, faculties can tag each question to the map a course and program outcome. So institutions are able to analyze um, these items to better understand uh, how students have performed towards each outcome. Uh, these data points are easy um, exported uh, for necessary reporting. And, and the benefit of this is that it provides institutions with the data points necessary um, to, provo um, to provide uh, accreditation requirements as well. Um, so you can see here the images you've got um, of some of the analytics. Um, so once you assign that assessment, that assessment has been co uh, completed, you can go back and say, oh, okay, so for question five, you know, 50 out of 100 students got this incorrect. What do I need to do? Is this another lesson? You know, what, what can I do to obviously improve that before, you know, the next uh, assessment period um, and be able to use that data as a really clear snapshot in terms of future proofing um, and what additional support students need. Actioning learning trends can be difficult. Uh, so you're able to see the trends um, and challenges in homework, quizzes um, and tests to address both class-wide and individual needs. Uh, Pre-question and pre-rubric item statistics show how students, courses, uh, as well as departments uh, pre uh, perform over time. So now I'm going to just show you a, a quick look at Gradescope just in terms of time. I don't have, I can't go too in-depth with you today, uh, but obviously if you're needing any more information or uh, about Gradescope, uh, please feel free to, to reach out or to, to send that, those questions to Michael and I can make sure that I get that information to you. So for this example today, it is a paper to pen digital uh, examination or assessment. Uh, so through conversations, again, from the start of the year to now, um, you know, through kind of uh, remote learning and so forth, a lot of those examinations went online. Um, now with AI and all things AI, uh, universities are talking about going back <laughs> um, to, to paper and pen uh, assessment. Um, so, you know, this is a way that Gradescope can really uh, support um, those paper um, and pen assessments and, and then transfer them to the digital. So the, uh, the outcome or the assessment has already been created for this scenario. Uh, your students have completed um, the assessment. They've handed in all of their papers through the manage scan option. So this isn't something that educators need to stand at a photocopier and do uh, Lisa's scan, uh, Michael's scan, Robert's scan. You can put them all together and put them through um, the photocopier and the rest is done for you. Um, it does, we use what's called OCR, which is optical character recognition. Um, to be able to manage these submissions. So you can see here that there has been 20 submissions and all of these 20 students have been matched to your LMS. Um, so this will go through, um, so your students will be able to see their results, their feedback and so forth through the LMS. So that's where that paper to digital component comes into play. So it matches the student name, student ID um, to the information within the LMS. That is all done for you. If we move on to then grading the submission, uh, we'll click on the first um, we have the ability to review groups. So you can see here um, in the question preview, these are all of the answers for this question being shown to you on the screen. So we have the, abil the ability to grade individually 
or we can really speed things up um, and we can grade from groups. So if I click form answer groups, and this is a maths fill in the blank question. So I can click on this and review answer groups. So within a matter of moments, that'll go through all of the submissions and the AI will group those submissions together. So at the top here, you can see that there are five confirmed groups for 17 answers and there's three um, ungrouped answers. So what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to review the first group. So even though obviously, you know, this is all done for you, we still rely on the teacher's eye to go through these and have a quick look in terms of are these grouped correctly? Um, and you have, obviously once you know that they are, you have the ability to confirm and review the next group. So what we can see here is group one, which is X2. And you can see that all of those answers matched and they are in the correct group. So we can confirm a next group. The second group, you can see here that there's actually three answers that are highlighted in the red box. So these are the questions or these are the answers that the AI isn't quite sure about. Um, and they have grouped them within group two, but they highly suggest that you uh, as the educator or the marker review these ones in particular and ensure that they belong in this group. So that all looks good to me. We can confirm and review next group. We then have um, group three, um, which is the question mark group. So that all looks pretty good. Uh, we have this group as well. So our group four or five, that all looks correct. So we can confirm, review next group. And the last group, group number five, all looks correct as well. So we do have this three here um, answers that were ungrouped. So they weren't put into a particular grouping. Um, so this one here you have, we're just going to put it in, I think, group three with the question mark. It was left blank. So you have the ability to drag and drop. Uh, the next one, we can scroll down, find that it belongs in group five. So you can either use the keyboard shortcut and just press number five on your keyboard. Uh, and this one belongs in number four. So that is it in terms of grouping the answers. You have checked everything. Um, they are all sitting within their uh, assigned groups and now it is time to grade them. <clears throat> so here you have the first group. So you have the ability to set up your rubrics uh, within Gradescope. Um, so you have, this is the three points. You can see here that I've created a rubric because um, it's missing the half. Um, it's also missing the plus C. So you have the ability to add a rubric item, create a group, and you have the ability to provide comments to this group. Um, so it could be well done group four, you've got the answer correctly, or it could be maybe group three that had all of the question marks. Uh, you know, can you all please come and see me? Uh, I want to provide some additional supporting materials and another side lesson on this to ensure that you understand this for future assessment. Or you have the ability to um, provide uh, previously used comments within your comment box. So here, all we would need to do, it is missing the half. So we would click on that and it is missing the C. So we would click on that. It would provide a one point mark out of three. And we go to the next ungraded. So that is four out of five submissions graded within a matter of minutes. So think of that when you're grading 100, 200, a thousand um, submissions, being able to do that um, in bulk at such speed is hugely time-saving. 
you have the ability as well with the dynamic rubric. So if you're wanting to go back and change something at a particular time, so you think, okay, I've actually, you know, minus a mark because they were missing this. And then you kind of get up to, I don't know, submission 125 and you think, oh, I might have been a bit hard. There's actually quite a lot of students that have done this. Um, I might actually just take off half a mark instead of a full mark. You have the ability to obviously change that and that will change for all of those submissions within that grouping. So you're not manually going back having to make changes after the fact. You have the ability to do that within, um, you know, bulk, um, which again is is hugely time contain, um time saving um, as well as you know taking out again that bias um, or you know being too harsh or kind of needing to to reassess um, what you've marked previously or how you mark moving forward so just one way that we can use AI as a positive in terms of how can it support you as educators what's all the good things um, that AI can do um, in terms of the assessment space um, and how things are changing moving forward. Lastly, uh, we'll be talking about the AI writing detection tool. Uh, so from a survey completed uh, by EDUCOURSE, 75% uh, uh, of respondents believe that academic integrity will be impacted the most um, as a result of generative AI. From our point of view and our customer feedback from the initial preview release, the majority of our responders found our feature to be helpful, um, are having a positive user experience, and are uh, uh, constructively contributing uh, enhancement ideas to our product team. So again, you know, the first release was uh, referred to as our preview release, essentially, um, so that, you know, we were able to get that into the hands of our educators and to our partners so we could get feedback um, from those that are using uh, the tool and we can ensure that we can make improvements where needed uh, and we can use uh, those uh, educator feedback um, to ensure that obviously we are spending uh, our development time in the right areas to ensure that this is uh, a tool that is the most beneficial um, to our partners. We do have some customer feedback, uh, so I am thankful for it. Uh, so this is referring to the AI detection tool. Um, I am thankful for it. As an English instructor, AI has been undermining my assessment. Uh, please continue to keep up with it. We need you. This is a game changer. I thank you for the innovation and purpose behind this great tool. And I strongly disagree with how this tool was rolled out. It is easy to use, but that is nowhere near as important as the ethical implications of the hazardous rollout. So a mixture of feedback. We've taken all of your feedback on board. Uh, you know, it's ways that we can obviously improve moving forward as a company and how we can best support our partners. Uh, so we've heard your feedback loud and clear. We really appreciate and we suggest and, and want that feedback to continue, um, especially as we continue to, to work on this tool uh, specifically moving forward. I believe you've all seen and have access uh, to the AI writing report. Uh, the indicator is linked to the AI writing report, which highlights the text segments that our model predicted uh, were written by AI. Only instructors and administrators are able to see the indicator and access the report. I've had a lot of feedback and questions around this in terms of, you know, 
when will students be able to see this? We would like students to be able to see this. We don't currently have that on our roadmap for this year. We are still obtaining lots of feedback in terms of how would it be beneficial for students to be able to see a report like this, ensure that they have the knowledge and understanding to be able to interpret the report. Uh, there's still a lot of internal conversations within the universities in terms of, you know, what will, how will they include AI? What's the right way to include it? You know, is there a right percentage and so forth around that use of AI uh, within assessments? Uh, so we're just holding off on providing that to the, the report to the students access at this point, but we are taking on that feedback. If you've got any addi additional kind of feedback or information or suggestions around that, uh, please feel free to, to pass them on. They will be um, greatly appreciated and I will ensure they make it to the AI team. We had a lot of requests in relation to the ability to download uh, and print the report for future review. Uh, so we listened to that feedback uh, a few weeks ago. We did release uh, the ability to download and print the AI report. Um, so that's, you know, one thing that I, I wanted to share and we have made additional uh releases and we are working on additional things um, so just to keep an eye on those because there are new things that are happening quite often and next in priority uh, we know that AI tools uh, such as ChatGPT tend to hallucinate a little bit uh, and make up false references. Uh, this, therefore, our next in priority, uh, we are working on our reference uh, validation. Uh, so this will save instructors time by providing reference checks, uh, highlighting references that have been matched to those previously submitted documents saved in our repository. Um, we are continuing to work on how to, you know, better improve the, the reference validation um, and we'll be gaining further insights and feedback once it's released. Um, so how we can obviously move you know, and include things that are not within our repository, um, but be able to, to validate those references accordingly as well. Uh, so that is next in priority. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. And I will share obviously more information um, when that is available. We have a dedicated uh, resource page um, to address AI in the classroom. Um, so again, Michael will share these links with you in the chat um, and you can have a look through and bookmark them. Uh, so we have the professional learning resources. Um, so AI generated texts, what educators are saying. There's a whole lot um, of things available, your educator resources, as well as um, instructional resources. So the AI use, misuse activity guide, student resources. Um, so handling false positives for, uh, for students, um, ethical AI use checklist for students. There's a whole heap of really awesome information and this gets updated all the time. So uh, please uh, have a look through this page. Um, feel free to, to join the educator network to be able to have these conversations with your peers um, in terms of all things AI, um, what we're working on, how our tool um, works and how we can support you with uh, these resources, particularly on our tool, um, as well as beyond that, uh, and just as AI um, in general. So AI conversations, handling false positives for educators, um, that's something that comes up quite a lot um, in terms of resources, having those conversations and how um, best to support our educators within those conversations. Additional <laughs> to the AI landing page, we also have our um, FAQ page. 
Um, I highly suggest everyone have a look at this one. Um, so these are those questions that we are getting asked day in, day out, have all been combined and put in the one spot for you to go to. So particularly, how does it work? Uh, we get asked that daily. Um, if you're wanting to know informa more information about how the tool actually worked, how has um, Turnitin's model been trained all of those kind of higher level technical questions, um, you know, and support around the tool itself. Um, the FAQ is is the way to go. It provides really good in terms of understanding um, and explanations on the tool itself. Um, I would highly suggest if you have any questions um, about the tool, how it works, um, to to check out this page of being sent you know, emails with a whole list of questions um, and, you know, 19 out of 20 of those questions could have been answered from um, this FAQ page. Um, what does the percentage in the AI writing detection indicator mean? Um, so really good um, supportive uh, explanations in terms to the tool itself to the score, what does it mean, how, um, you know, the, the tool works, how our model was trained, um, the scope of detection, um, the access and licensing. So pretty much everything you, you need to know, um, you'll, you'll be able to find on this page. We get asked all the time about, is your current model able to detect ChatGPT4? Again, all your answers will be on this page. If they are not, obviously, feel free to, to send those questions over um, and I'll ensure that I reach out to the team and get those questions asked for you. Um, we're always adding to this, updating, uh, removing, all of those type of things. So how does Turnitin ensure that the false positive rates for a document remains less than 1%? all of those type of things, which I'm sure you're wondering, I'm sure you're having conversations um, amongst your peers and within um, your university about um, definitely go to this page and, and check it out and bookmark it because like I said, it does get updated on a regular basis. Um, and Michael will share, share those links with you as well uh, as we had some really good blog posts um, about the, the understanding of the false positives um, and what we do um, in those uh, scenarios. Turnitin uh, is equipped to help learners, instructors and administrators with the challenges in education today. Uh, our long history and deep experiences um, as a trusted partner for more than 15,000 institutions globally have built a, a powerful foundation uh, that benefits everyone. Uh, benefits you as our partners. We do appreciate your feedback. Um, so there is the ability to leave feedback directly um, within the AI interface within that report. Um, so please feel free to, if you've got any even suggestions, um, you know, future product requests, insights, those type of things, um, please feel free to complete that, that user feedback form. We have the in-product surveys um, that can be completed within the AI um, detection tool also. And you've got me, your account manager. So your first point of call, if you've got any feedback in terms of not just the AI um, indication tool, um, but any of our products and services or how we can better improve um, all the information that obviously I can provide you, please feel free uh, to, to reach out and to let me know. Um, you can connect with me um, via LinkedIn. Um, I always share some really good resources. I know that a lot of educators are relying on LinkedIn in terms of what's happening um, within education and the AI space currently. So if you're wanting any of those kind of tips or tricks, please feel free to connect with me or provide any of the feedback back that you have. Um, I would always be happy to hear it and uh, appreciate it. So that is enough from me. <laughs> As promised, we do have uh, 10 minutes left. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to ask.
Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Everyone's giving you a virtual round of applause. Click, click the you. reactions button, ladies and gentlemen, or do this. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and uh, Robert has already got his hand up. He snuck in Perfect. early and I'm going uh, to hand over to Robert for his question. Mine great, is you. quick. Do we at CQU have access to Gradescope? No, not currently. Um, I would suggest, though, um, you can go to gradescope.com and actually sign up um, for a, what we essentially call is a complimentary license. Um, so something that it's it's kind of like a trial license. It allows you, uh, I believe, a semester um, in terms of being able to use Gradescope, see its complete functionality um, and being able to kind of trial and test that. That's something that we don't have with any of our other products or services. It's only something specific to Gradescope um, and everyone loves it. Um, so if you go to, to gradescope.com, you have the ability to uh, sign up for a license um, for complete access um, for a semester. Once that semester period finishes, then you go back to the basic um, license, which only has kind of like two or three of the features of Gradescope. Um, but obviously when you um, have complete access, you have uh, access to all of the features. Um, and there is a list of all of those that are included. So definitely I can share that link with you. Um, and we have some resources and some training and, and development around that as well, if that's something that you're wanting to kind of trial. Awesome. Thank you. I had a look in the chat. I don't think there's anybody from ITD in the chat or if they are, they're hiding well. Um, I mean, obviously that we could also do that, poke our IT department and say, should we have access to Gradescape? I thought it was really interesting. I was talking to Robert, you know, in private chat behind the scenes and saying, uh, I love the way it groups stuff together. I mean, mm. from an academic point of view, that got me uh, uh, very excited. Um, I'm going to sneak yeah. in a question. If anyone else has a question, um, feel free to put your hand up if you want to or type in the chat. And as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll relay the question for you. My question while we're talking about Gradescape, Lisa, is what about more qualitative style questions? I watch it mm. and I've got, a, I've got a sort of a take home exam at the end of term, but the, mm -hmm. the, the answers the students give are bigger. Is it any good at that or is it more sort of the... Um, the, the what you showed was the more mathy sort of quantitative no it's got there's a whole and I can send you if you I can send you through the whole list um but in terms of all of those um different types of of questions so it can be long answer um it can be okay. short answer it can be multiple choice um, a lot of the kind of uh, STEM subject areas do love Gradescope because it obviously provides the student the ability to do the work show working um, from their answers. Uh, so that's hugely important to those subject areas. Um, but that's, there's bubble sheets, multiple choice, long answers, short answers. There's a whole range. So pretty much you've got your, your feedback studio with originality for all your long form written um, assessment. Uh, and then you've got that complementary like grade scope that does all the other kind of assessment uh, types um, so yeah, there's a whole a whole list of assessment types that it covers, um, and it does so really well. It just in terms obviously with those kind of short answer and and long answers with the AI grouping and and rubrics, um, it, it's kind of hard obviously for the system to be able to do that with that form of written assessment. Um, but there's a heap of ru rubrics um, and, and tools that you can use to hugely speed up that process as well so it may not be the AI generated grouping for long answers for example um, but you still have uh, really good tools and rubrics dynamic rubrics available to you that speed up that okay. process immensely I might have a look at it see I've got a, as I said I've got something at the end of term um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna interpret a couple of things that came in the chat that I want to throw at you and you may say go read the fact and that's fine um a couple of people were talking about that ai percentage and mm -hmm. uh and, and somebody asked how accurate is the percentage and then michelle vanderberg robert's wife came back and said um said uh i think what it does is it actually identifies 
how much AI generated text is on the page and that's what the percentage represents. Is that a, is what the way Michelle described it accurate or again, I you know, say it's too complicated, Mike can go and No, no, <laughs> yeah, that's not complicated. Yeah. No, yeah. that's not complicated. And and that is spot on. Um so it does so kind of like obviously it's very different to the similarity report, but you know the, the percentage is essentially how much of that tech. So it would be 12%. So if you've got a 12% AI score, it would be 12% of the whole document, which has been flagged as written by AI. So it, it is covered in the FAQ, um, but exactly how um, it was explained uh, and answered in the chat is exactly um, is, is correct. It is the percentage of um, AI detection within the whole document. So it would be 12% of the whole document um, has been flagged as AI written. And I think Michelle Gray has asked a question in the chat, which I do think you're going to sneakily defer, which is, well, what about when the text is different? The text is different each time it's asked. How do you match it? And maybe you'll, maybe you'll say that's the turn it in magic. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that question. What do you mean and by what she's saying is 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 if you're doing a matching algorithm where you're saying um you're saying this is this is artificial intelligence text in there mm -hmm. um and you're matching it to say some AI text that you've generated. Well, doesn't that AI text that you've generated change every time? So how do you match them together? It, it, is that ever no, so it doesn't match to, so the AI, so the highlighted AI text doesn't match to an AI generated text. Um, so we don't have AI, well, it, we, eventually it will, we will have a repository because the more the AI is used, but what it, it doesn't actually, so like the similarity report, it will say, okay, so this section that's highlighted matches to this source. With the AI component, it doesn't match to a source. So it doesn't say, okay, so this a um, this highlighted AI text matches to, you know, chat GPT or matches to another AI uh, writing tool. It just says that this is from uh, our system, how we have generated through our model highlighted as AI written. So it doesn't actually have a source. That's something that we have had questions yeah. about. Like, is there a way that we can say, okay, what source does this match to rather than the prediction is that it is AI generated text. Um, so I hope that ex answers your question. Yeah, no, I think um, that makes sense. Yeah, but it doesn't actually match to a source. So even when it does changes, um, and you can read about how the, the model is. And so essentially when, you know, something is AI generated, it predicts the next word um, within that sentence. Um, so, you know, for example, you might say, I live in a brown, and then it could come up with house, cottage, farm, barn mm. um so it kind of generates and provides a list of the next predicted word mm. um so that's if yeah if you read more the obviously the faq explains it a lot better than i do in terms of the technical yeah. side of things um but it is the ai percentage is the ai generated text not a source you did pretty well before you pointed people towards the FAQ. Well done. Um, <laughs> um, but no, that was a very good answer. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase a question from Jimbo. Um, and Jimbo typed in the chat and he can he can talk if he wants to, but I'm kind of going to paraphrase him. Jimbo is a emeritus champion for the for the telecom. He previously was a champion. Um, and he's kind of written a couple of things in the chat that make me want to ask you, what do you think from a turn it in point of view? And maybe not from a turn it in point of view because you'll get in trouble if you try and represent the entirety of turn it in. But is AI our future? Is is AI coming no matter what we do? And Jimbo has written a couple of things in the chat where it kind of suggested it can be used for good. You said a similar kind of thing. Do yeah. you think we've got to deal with the fact that AI is going to be in our future? Is that a, is that a reasonable paraphrase, Jimbo? I can see he's got his mic. It, it is. It is because we in digital media uh, support it. And I, I put a comment up there in a, a school of education, the arts meeting. AI was presented to us as 
a cheating tool. And the example that was given was, we don't want students who are use, doing the right thing and using Grammarly to be penalized, unlike those people who are using chat GPT. And we all just mm. rolled our eyes. And went, well, <laughs> Grammarly doesn't just put full stops and commas in, it's got mm. generative AI and can create content. What, mm-hmm. what we actually need to do is better educate our students and you know, students who struggle with writing, I have no problems with students writing content, putting it into chat GPT and saying, proofread my work. Um, you know, it's up, the onus is on them. If we say, mm-hmm. hey, we think you've created this in, in AI to, you know, to produce drafts of their work so we can compare it. But mm-hmm. it's it's certainly in our future, we're going to use it to improve our writing. And it's actually a a useful educational tool for students to identify gaps in their writing and, and understand how they can write better. Mm-hmm. You know, the the comment uh, that was mentioned about, you know, can it definitively identify chat GPT? Having used chat GPT for, for quite some time, you know, th- there's patterns in what it does. It loves the word delve, for example. So whenever you <laughs> yes. put in the word explore or investigate, it it loves delve. It looks for opportunities yeah. to use the word delve. So there, there are patterns and it tends to repeat itself and make stuff up as well. That's um, right. But, you know, make, making our students aware that there's there's ways to use it meaningfully as part of their workflows, I think, is, is important. And I think it's going to be really difficult for you guys to detect stuff because any, any student who's worth their salt really – shouldn't be you know if they get chat gpt to generate stuff from scratch sure mm-hmm. i say surely but you know the the um the oh, who was it the nrlw this week got in trouble for doing it if you get output from chat gpt surely you're going to look at it and rewrite rewrite yeah. it a bit you know you would think you would um, think and so i it's, think it's too, a tricky it's a, whole, yeah. it's a tricky thing Definitely. I, I agree with, with everything there. And I think it, it is to finding that balance um, in terms of, you know, where it can be used, when, how, those type of things. And those conversations are still happening. Um, we're still learning off our partners um, in terms of even in the since this last first came out to now, those conversations have 360 quite a few times. So, you know, about, okay, well, th- there was panic around this and obviously students use Using it, you know, for not the greater of good. Um, but then there's, you know, now it's like, oh, we've had guest speakers and blogs and things about how students are using this for good, how educators, how, you know, up to professional, all of those type of things. So there are different scenarios, circumstances and outputs um, that it can be used. Um, do I think it's going to be included in our future? I've heard many examples that refer to or kind of relate to when the calculus later came out um, and there was a little bit of panic about okay well when could when should the calculator be used when should we probably allow students to use this essentially we're taking away that learning because a student can put in well you know what this equation is and they can get the answer without having to do the working without having to show that knowledge um, so that kind of correlation um, between you know the when the calculator come out and then things like Grammarly and all of those things things well you know should students be using this but how can we help students um, use these tools and you know provide that support around how students can use these kind of tools in the best way as well Um, you know so to be able to use to improve their writing to be able to use through their drafting period um, you know and then maybe would they submit their draft and then you know submit their submission that included um, AI writing so as an educator you can see both Um, so there's still lots of, of conversations happening around you know how we move forward with this but I definitely think that um, you know as we do move forward that we will continue to learn and these things these conversations will continue to happen and um it will be included that's, um, in that's good that I think that's do. a good that's a good hot take Lisa I mean you know turn it in account manager says that we've still got a lot to learn about AI is that the uh, no I don't know maybe that <laughs> maybe that'll get yeah. her in trouble I'm not sure no. um, <laughs> awesome okay no we're, problem. we're, we're learning with you we're learning with yeah, you that's, so. we're learning with you we're happy to learn with you that's a more positive spin I like it um, okay ladies and gentlemen we better wind up I see that people are disappearing because we have gone over time over two o'clock so we're going to say one more time thank you so much Lisa 
for your time. I will share the uh, recording, ladies and gentlemen, um, and uh, with Lisa's permission, the slides or at least the links from the slides. Mm -hmm. And um, if you do want to touch base with Lisa, let's say, for example, to, you know, run a grassroots initiative that we should have grade scope at CQU. I'm sure she's available on LinkedIn via via messaging as well. But thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody that came to the Telcop. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye.